Thank you. Thank you everybody for joining us today for this first uh, self-directed IRA meeting. We may have a couple of stragglers jump on and stuff. So um, this is the first one. So we'll work through the technical difficulties, but let's go ahead and get started. Um, I do want to welcome Jill Banner and Matt. Is it Tillich or Tillich? Yeah, you got it right the first time. Thank you. All right. Tillich uh, with iPlan Group. They are our featured guests today. They are going to discuss self-directed IRAs with us. Um, I'm Blaze Ross, or I'll kind of host the meeting along with Frank Ruma. And uh, we're going to just give the podium to you, Jill, and let you do a brief overview of what the self-directed IRA looks like. Great, great. So a self-directed IRA is a way that you can use your IRA funds to purchase alternative assets. And some of these assets that we're going to talk about today are real estate um, or even private, private lending using your IRA. So um, the IRA acts similar to a trust where um, you open an account just like you would with a TD Ameritrade or a Scott Trade or Merrill Lynch, and you would roll funds over into the IRA. If you don't have an orphan IRA or an old 401k to roll over, you can make a new contribution to the IRA. So that's how you get your IRA funded. Once the account is open and funded, you can purchase these alternative assets, real estate. Um, land trusts, you can purchase um, boat slips, any, any type of real estate. The one thing that you're going to want to keep in mind when you're putting something under contract is that the IRA is purchasing it, not you. So we would title the, we would uh, do the contract in the name of the IRA. So our IRA titling is iPlan Group, uh, Agent for Custodian, FBO, Jill Banner IRA. That's how the title of the contract would be. Um, the, then the IRA, you would let us know what you're going to purchase and when you're going to purchase it. You would send us a form uh, for that. You'd say, Jill, I want to purchase 123 Main Street. We're closing next Thursday. We're using this title company. This is the documents that need signed. And these are the funds that you'll need to send. You'll send those instructions to us and we'll execute that transaction for you. That's kind of a high level overview of how it would work to, for real estate. Now, there's a couple little caveats that you're want, going to want to keep in mind. Um, the IRS does not want you to use your IRA funds to purchase a property and then you live in it. That would be a prohibited transaction. They also would not want you to purchase a property and have your children, your spouse, or your parents live in it. It's a lineal ascendant or a linear descendant. Um, that you cannot uh, use the property for. If you wanted to buy a property and rent it to your brother, your sister, your uncle, you can, you're welcome to do that. Once the property is purchased and you put it inside of the IRA, anything that has to do with that property needs to be contained inside of the IRA. And by that, I mean any rental income that comes in goes back into the IRA. Any expenses that you have will come out of the IRA. So if you have to pay the water, the sewer, the gas, the plumber, um, you'll let us know what those bills are and we'll pay out of the IRA for you. We'll keep all the records um, on behalf of your IRA. Um, let's say that you wanted to do a flip on the property and you purchased the property here in Cleveland for 100,000, you did 30,000 of repairs and you sold it for 200. Um, at, the at the closing, the 200,000 would go back into your IRA and you would not pay capital gains tax on it because it's contained in your IRA. Now, once you um, are retired and start taking distributions, you'll pull the money out of your IRA and you'll be taxed on it at that time at ordinary income rates. So when you do a flip inside of your IRA, there is no taxes. Um, there's another method uh, that's really powerful. Let's talk about the two different types of IRAs first. So there's two different types of IRAs. There's a traditional IRA and a Roth IRA. A traditional IRA is something that you contribute to now and you get a tax deduction for putting it in now. So let's say you put in $5,000, you would uh, take $5,000 off of your ordinary income um, as a deduction. Now there's another uh, account called a Roth IRA. A Roth IRA is when you don't get the deduction going in, but the growth of your IRA is tax-free. You'll never pay taxes on it. And the reason I wanna share that Roth IRA is because I wanna share a technique that some of our clients use. And they use a Roth IRA when they're wholesaling a property. So I'll explain how that works. So let's say Matt puts a property under contract um, he uses the name of his IRA, iPlan Group, Agent for Custodian, FBO, Matt's IRA, and he puts it under contract for $1,000. Uh, 
Um, and that contract is uh, to purchase the property at $100,000. So in consideration of $1,000, he has the opportunity to purchase the property over the next 30 days at $100,000. He then sells that contract to Frank for $130,000. So now Frank has the contract to purchase the house at $130,000. Matt's going to make $30,000 on this transaction. And he's only using $1,000 from his Roth. So he's literally taking a $1,000 Roth and turning it into a $30,000, $31,000 Roth IRA in a matter of 30, within 30 days. It's a really powerful technique to grow your Roth IRAs if you don't have one started or if you're you know, a little late to the game on the Roth IRAs. Wholesaling is a fabulous way to do that. The other thing that your Roth IRA can do or that any IRA can do uh, with respect to real estate is private lending. So I used to do a lot of real estate and um, I had trailer parks and it's a lot of brain damage that uh, is required, you know, with tenants, toilets, trash and turnover and trailers. So um, I do a lot of hard money lending now. So let's say I have 100,000 and Matt wants to purchase a property, but he doesn't have the cash. My IRA can loan him $100,000. Typically, he and I are going to negotiate a rate. Typically, it's a little, you know, it's hard money rate. So maybe I'm going to get 12%. So Matt's going to pay me 12% on my 100000 I'm going to secure it by the property. I'm going to have a lawyer drop the paperwork. I'm going to put a lien on the property, put a mortgage on the property. And I'm going to make sure he has the proper insurance on the property in case it burns down. So I'm pretty protected as long as I'm careful about my loan to value. So I probably won't give him $100,000 on an acquisition cost of $70,000 with repairs of thirty, dollars but I'll definitely loan him $100,000 if the after repair value is you know, $200,000 and his acquisition cost is $100,000. So you want to make sure you're secured. So you can do pri private lending. You can loan your IRA or you could borrow someone's IRA or you could purchase the property outright, or you could wholesale a deal as well. This also works well for uh, turnkey rentals. So let's say that you have a property, it's already rented and your IRA buys it. Immediately the rental income goes back into your IRA um, and grows on a tax deferred or tax free basis, depending on the type of account you have. So that's a high level overview. Uh, we talked about prohibited parties. We talked about prohibited transactions. That means you can't use your IRA to buy a house that you live in or that your children live in. Um, we talked about straight acquisition, wholesaling, uh, private lending. Can you think of any other questions or any other situations you want me to go over? Yeah, actually, um, Gary has a question I'll read to you mm -hmm. and discuss the advantages or disadvantages of a self-directed IRA compared to a 1031 exchange. Um, there are just two, uh, two very s uh, separate animals. Um, what, if you start, if the property is owned inside of the IRA in the, in the get-go, you won't have to do a 1031 exchange because you won't pay taxes, I'm capital there. taxes on, on it. Um, a 1031 is going to be great if you already own something in your name um, that you can't sell to your own IRA. That's one thing. You cannot take anything that you currently own and sell it to your IRA. That would also be a prohibited transaction. So anything that you currently own and sell and don't want to pay the taxes on, you'll need to do a 1031 exchange. With the self-directed IRAs, you would not need to do a 1031 exchange because the funds go back into your IRA on a tax deferred or tax-free basis. Okay. And then you mentioned doing a flip with an IRA. However, it, most of the guys doing flips are doing the work themselves or having their own crews go in. Are they able to do that? Um, technically, the IRS says that you cannot enhance your own IRA with sweat equity. You can't swing the hammer. You should be writing checks to the, you should be arm's length and writing checks to the plumber, the HVAC, the carpenter. So you probably shouldn't. I mean, you can manage the crews, but you certainly can't pay yourself out of your own IRA to do the work. So the IRA would pay and we would, we would hire out the contractors to do everything. Absolutely. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now let's say you had a little bit of money and you wanted to, you needed just rehab money. You could, you, you could borrow Matt's IRA for rehab. So you can structure them a couple different ways. Let's say that Matt and I wanted to partner um, and I had 50,000 in an IRA and he had 50,000. We could take down a property together. It would be titled as Jill's IRA, 50% undivided interest with Matt's IRA, 50% undivided interest. So we would both be, our both of our IRAs would be on the deed. When the rental income comes in, if we were to rent it, 
the say a thousand dollars comes in, half of that money goes to my IRA, half goes to his IRA. If we have an expense, if we have to put a new roof on, half of the expense comes from my IRA, half of the expense comes from his IRA. It's just like partnering with another person or doing some sort of JV joint venture. The IRAs can partner together. Does it always have to be 50-50 or could it be a 70-30? That's a really great question. So it does not have to be 50-50. As a matter of fact, my children have Coverdell education accounts. Those are also a type of IRA that you can have to cover ex uh, education expense at a later date. So those start off at, you can only contribute 2000 per year per child. So they can start pretty small. And if I'm going to, so I pull my kids' IRAs in with mine. And so they might own, in one of my deals, they each own 5% of the deal and I owned 85%. Um, or I've done it where it's even like 1.039% because I want to keep their funds moving and making uh, making money. Because if I'm getting 18%, I, I don't care if they only have $2,000, I still want them to get 18% on their money. Now, does it have to be a partnership with another self-directed IRA or could you go into it with, an individual. You could absolutely go into it with an individual or another IRA. It doesn't matter. It's just just think of the IRA as its own its own separate person. So just like a person can partner with different people or different IRAs, same same as your IRA. You just want to keep it separate from yourself and not commingle your funds with your IRA funds, your personal so funds, with your IRA funds. You're only allowed to put so much in per year based on you know your familiar status and you know to try to figure that out. But it does, you don't immediately have enough to pay for a whole house cash. But you could use that as a down payment if somebody's willing to do a loan with you or borrow it from somebody else that has a self-directed IRA. Is that what I heard? That's a great question. And yes, you can absolutely borrow someone else's IRA. You could leverage your IRA. Let's say I only have $20,000 and I'm purchasing a $100,000 house. I can use that as a $20,000 as a down and get basically a mortgage on the rest. And there's one small caveat that we'll talk about that. And that's because the IRS says that I'm purchasing a hundred thousand dollar property, although I'm only using 20,000 of my IRA. So there's a leveraged piece of $80,000. So there's something called unrelated debt financed income that they want a little piece of that levered portion of the IRA. And your accountant can help you figure out um, if that's the best way to do it, or if it's better to partner, or if it's better just to use someone else's funds completely on the property, there's different strategies that you can use. You could use seller financing, correct? Absolutely, yes. Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah. Jill, Gary has another question. Um, we cannot extract funds from the self-directed IRA until what age, and what would the taxes be similar to capital gains? Um, so at 59 and a half, you can start taking it without penalty. If you take it prior to 59 and a half, you'll have a 10% penalty. Um, and you'll take it at ordinary income uh, rates, not capital gains rate. So even if you, you, you know, made half a million dollars inside of your IRA based on a flip, which typically outside the IRA would be capital gains, when you take it here, it comes as ordinary income. So... When you're buying a rental property outside the IRA, you have depreciation on your taxes and everything there. How does that work within the self-directed IRA? That's a great question because we're in a self, uh, because we're in a tax sheltered vehicle, you don't get to take any of the expenses or the depreciation. Um, and you don't have to recapture the depreciation. It's literally asset purchase, expenses, income, and you, you won't even have to put this on your, because everything's done inside of the IRA, you won't have to put anything other than contributions or distributions on your taxes. So these properties don't even appear on your personal income tax. So if I were to break this down to like somebody that's never dealt with an IRA or investing or anything, if I had a, an account with a brokerage firm that I set up my 401k in, cause I used to work at a, at a, at a company that had a hundred thousand employees, that, that 401k, I could go in there and I could buy mutual funds, I could buy Apple stock or any type of stock in there. Um, and my money could either be lost or I could gain from it, depending on how well I chose those companies. That same principle applies here. We're just not buying companies, we're buying real estate, correct? 
Absolutely. Also, the IRS says that you can purchase other things besides real estate. So just so you're aware of, I know this is real estate focused, but you could do physical gold. You could do a, a private company. You could do lending. You, we, have a, we have a gentleman that purchased pigs inside of his IRA in the spring and sold them in the fall. And that profit made went back into the IRA. So there's- um, What happens when he feeds the pigs himself? Um, that would be a prohibited transaction. He is not allowed to eat his own pigs. <laughs> Uh, all right. Well, do you have any more questions from the chat thing, Cheech? No, nope, that's it. Okay. Um, let's... I'll share one other thing. You can purchase foreign real estate. So we do have a client that purchased a rental property in the Bahamas. Um, so that's uh, that's feeding her her retirement. Now she cannot go down and stay in it herself, and she'll need to outsource, you know, the management and the and the repairs and maintenance. Um, but you can do foreign property as well. Okay. Um, let's see here. Are there any? Is there anybody that's on the call that has a question that they want to throw out here as well? I ha I just have a, a a silly one. But how tough is it to get the utilities in the IRA's name? Uh, it's not tough at all. We do it. They, we have clients that do it all the time. And then, as far as lenders that will finance when the buyer is an IRA, you you have lenders that do that, right? Um, we have clients that we, we've kind of keep a list. We don't recommend it or endorse any particular person, but there's lots of lenders out there and you'll just want to make sure that it's going to be a non-recourse loan. That's the only thing we care about. That means take the property, don't take my IRA. So um, we just need to find a non-recourse lender. And actually their, their rates are pretty competitive. Um, considering yeah, IRA. Do you have any wholesalers that do it? Not that I'm aware of. Okay. Wholesaling is a really powerful way to, to take a little bit of cash and turn it into a lot more tax deferred or tax free. Well, I meant wholesaling. Tim's a mortgage oh. lender. He, he's got wholesalers that lend him money. So, mm -hmm. Tim, but yeah, do you have any questions? So, as far as lending, if you've got people that are lending you their cash, you're paying them an interest rate. Let's say it's ten percent. They're paying they're paying taxes on that 10% that they just earned. If they do it inside of their IRA, they're getting that full 10% in, in growing their IRA without having to pay tax on the interest income that they're earning. So I've got three private uh, individuals that lend me money for my properties. Mm -hmm. um, but like you said, they are paying taxes on it because my CPA sends them a 1099 every year. Correct. So how do they, how do they set up um, a self-directed IRA? Um, they would get in touch with someone like me or Matt, and then Matt would sit and talk with them about how, how it works. We would send them an application, you know, name, address, beneficiary. We'd pull funds from either a, an IRA that they currently have. We'd roll over funds um, from some sort of old 401k, or they could make new contributions um, to the IRA. Once the funds are here, no matter whatever the method is, they'd be ready to lend it to you. You would create a promissory note between you and your bar and your lender, um, and negotiate the terms. So maybe you, um, you know, maybe it's eight percent, maybe it's ten, maybe it's twelve, whatever you negotiate. And then you would, uh, they would let us know, hey, I want to loan Tim my IRA. I want to loan him a hundred thousand on the twelfth. Um, why are the funds here? And then once he has, once we get those instructions from you, we execute the transaction. And then he, you make your payments uh, to, to him through, through his IRA. So they would come to us. We would receive the checks, put it in his account, and then let him know that we received, you know, $1,200 from Tim for 123 Main Street. So it's a, it's a pretty steep streamlined process, but it's a way for them to have some tax free interest on stuff that they're already doing or tax deferred if it's in a, if it's in a traditional IRA. Now, is it, would it work like this? Like, let's say I have an IRA or a 401k, well, let's say an IRA, a, a, a IRA with a lot of funds sitting in it. And I want to use a certain percentage of funds for purchase of, a, of an investment, a house. So I would transfer from that IRA to this IRA a certain amount of money because it's not earning interest in your IRA except when we invest it, right? Correct. When, it, when the cash is sitting here, you're not earning anything. Correct. Right. I would only so like in Tim's case, his investor might transfer thirty thousand dollars over to you to be used for Tim's next project. Exactly. Um, they don't need to send me their whole million dollar portfolio. Just send over the portion that they're going to use in in these alternative investments. And then Tim turned their thirty thousand into sixty thousand because it was a good investment, and he sold it and flipped it. Good money. So now the guy's got sixty thousand there. 
he's ready to use another 30, he can take that other 30 and put it back into his other IRA because it's just going from one IRA to another IRA, right? There's no... Correct. It's a trustee to trustee transfer. So there's no tax disadvantage to doing that. Okay. That's beautiful. Mm -hmm. You mentioned, and I kind of put this in the advertising of, of getting this uh, conference call together, you could also use an HSA account. I didn't hear you mention that earlier. Yeah, that's a great question. So we have regular IRAs and tradi traditional IRAs, Roth IRAs. We also have, for those of you who have your own businesses, we have a simple, a SEP, and an individual 401k. Those business types of IRAs help you put more than just five or $6,000 per year. Um, for example, with a 401k, you could put upwards of 50,000 tax deferred into. So we have three business types of accounts. Then we also have a Coverdell education account, which I mentioned. Um, it's to fund children's education or yeah, education expenses. And then we also have a health savings self-directed IRA. So it's just like your regular health savings account. You put money in, you get a tax deduction as it goes in. It grows tax-free as well. So it's a pretty powerful account. Um, if you need to use the funds, you'll use them for a qualified medical expense. Um, so we have HSAs, Coverdell education accounts, three business types accounts, and then two individual type of accounts. And you can partner them. So let's say that I have a husband and he's got an IRA and we have an HSA. All three of those accounts can partner together to take down a deal. Now, in Frank's previous question, he mentioned using using money to uh, buy an investment or to lend out for an investment property but when it's not invested in a property or being lent out and it's sitting within i planned uh account there's no interest being gained on it can they switch it back to their regular 401k account or Absolutely. with the yeah. somebody during that time to put it back in a, in a an investment Sure, absolutely. We have a lot of clients, though, that what they do instead is they'll they'll have a property for a hundred thousand. They sold it for one thirty. Now the one thirty is sitting in there, and they're looking for another investment. We can open a TD Ameritrade account right next to your IRA account. Slide the funds over. They trade for a couple months until they identify the other property. Then they slide it right back and purchase the property. So you can send it to your to your Merrill Lynch guy, or you could you know do a TD Ameritrade little swap through us as well. Okay. Does anybody else have any questions on the line? All right. Uh, that was a ton of information. It was like drinking out of a fire hose. So there's, there's quite a bit. You have a PDF that you're going to send over to me and I'll forward out to everybody. And then uh, we've recorded this call so we can share that with a few other people. And uh, we may do this again soon. So we truly appreciate your time today. Um, that was a lot of information and I, I, I loved it. Any follow-up comments, Frank? No, it was great. Yeah. Um, I will have one more thing. When you, when you are talking with your clients and maybe you're lending money or um, you're, you're borrowing from their IRAs, you don't have to be the expert. Certainly just get on a call with Matt or myself. Um, we're happy to educate whoever you know, you're working with on, on it's legal. This is, you know, they might not have heard of it before. So some people could be skeptical. You don't have to be the expert. Just call us, conference us in. Um, this is what Matt does almost all day, his uh, strategy sessions with, with clients and, and prospective clients. So feel free to use us as experts. Awesome. All right, guys. Well, I think that is it. Jill, if you can just remember to send me that PDF. I think we're all good and uh, appreciate everyone's time today. Thank all right. You. Thanks. Thanks very much. Nice to meet you, Matt. Mm -hmm. Nice to meet you too. Thank <laughs> you.